Hey everybody, I apologize. Um, I tried to go live and show my face and then switch to the PowerPoint, but apparently you can't switch. You have to pick, are you going with the video or are you going with PowerPoint? So I really wanted to do PowerPoint, so I really apologize for the, the mess up there. Some technical difficulties and really some user error. So I apologize for that. Hopefully it'll go better from here on out. I am going to check my screen real quick and make sure I'm live. And I'll give people a couple minutes to uh, get on as well. So let's see. I am live. That's good. And it looks like um, things are working. Good morning, Angelo. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming back on again. I apologize for the snafu there. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to go through these lessons. I said this in the previous video, which I'm going to try to go back and delete because it lasted 30 seconds. But I'm really, um, it's been really good for me to go through this. Uh, good morning, Heather. It's good to see you. It's been good for me as a parent to prepare for these sessions and prepare for this week, looking at the scripture passages, thinking through um, what the Bible says to parents. So I've benefited from it, and hopefully you guys will too. But I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity to do this. Um, we're going to talk today about being examples to our kids. And it's really important. And because our kids pick up what they see and hear from us doing and saying more than us trying to teach them. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'll give a couple minutes for some people to get on and then we'll jump into it. So make sure you have your Bible. You're going to be looking at the Bible, and if you want to take notes, you can have something to take notes with. What I can do is, uh, after this is over, I can put up my notes for you guys to look at, if that would be a help. So I guess I can upload this. It's just a Word document, so I can upload that, and I can get you the PowerPoint if that would help as well. All right, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint back up here. Let's see, slideshow. Okay, now I gotta like flip through here. So let me flip through. Da -da -da. Oh, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> All right, yeah, I think we've waited a couple minutes. Uh, let's get started. So again, um, let's start with prayer and then we'll get into our uh, material. God, you are so good to us. You are patient. You are forgiving. You love us. You love us with your words and your actions. And we never have to wonder if you're gonna keep your promise or if you've said something, but you're not gonna do it. You always keep your word and your saying is your doing. So thank you for being a great father to us and a great example that we as parents want to emulate. I pray, God, that through this study and through your word and through your Holy Spirit, that you would draw us closer to yourself and make us more like your son, Jesus, that we would be excellent parents and raise up the next generation to be godly, to love you and to love other people well. So I ask for your help now, and I ask that you would bless this time and bless those who are watching now and who will watch later. I pray you'd use it to glorify your name and strengthen your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, uh, yesterday we looked at Genesis 1 through 3, and we saw how the family was created, and we saw how sin affected the family. And basically what we learned, we learned, one, the family is important. It was God's idea. It was God's provision for people. And it's God's plan. And so the family bears responsibility before God to do it his way. And it's more important than work. Our family is more important than our stuff. Our family is more important than whatever else is going on in the world. Our first responsibility is to our family. The second thing we learned is that sin came into the world and made family life difficult. We all have sin in us. We're all bent towards sin now. And because of that, our neutral gear is towards sin. So raising our families requires active effort. We have to swim against the tide. We have to swim against the current and not with it if we're going to raise our families well. I want you to picture an escalator 
you're at a mall. Um, actually, yeah, I guess you're at a mall. In uh, in Turkey, they have them at grocery stores and stuff. But if you're at a mall and there's an escalator, one goes up and one goes down. Picture an escalator going down, and you're standing at the bottom of that escalator, but you want to get up. So you're on the first floor and you want to get to the second floor. The escalator is continually rolling down, down, down. Well, if you want to get up, that means you're going to have to put forth active effort. You're going to have to walk faster, run faster, hop faster than the escalator. If you stop and you just kind of stand still, well, you're going to be going down, right? Because the escalator is taking you down. And trying to parent our children toward godliness, trying to train ourselves for godliness is just like trying to walk up an escalator that's going down, at least right now in this life, on this earth. So that's why it requires constant intentional effort. There's, there's no neutral. You're either advancing in godliness or you're advancing in sin. There's no, there's no I'm just standing still. So I like, I like the escalator analogy. And I think that's a good analogy for us trying to raise our kids. I don't want it to be uh, disheartening. It's certainly doable to raise our kids in the Lord. We just have, we can't be passive. Passive parenting will not work. We have to be active. Okay, so we learned we need active effort and that family is worth our effort because it's important. So what do we do? We're ready. We're ready to start running up the escalator, swimming against the current. Well, we have to start with ourselves. For two reasons, we are we are always examples to our children, whether for good or for bad, for better or for worse. Our our children see us, hear us, are they're always watching us, and they're always learning from us. They're learning either good things or bad things, good examples or bad examples. Uh, the other reason we need to start with ourselves before we try to start discipling our children is that we can't lead our children to grow in godliness if we're not growing in godliness as well. And this is true of any type of leadership. If you're in leadership, you can't lead someone past where you are personally. You can't show them the way if you haven't been down that way before. So if I'm going on a hike with someone, I want someone who's been down that trail before and they know when the turns are coming, they know when this and that's coming. If I try to go hike with someone and they're going to lead me, but they've never done it themselves, well, they're not really leading me. So we start with ourselves so that we can be the examples to our children and so that we can know the way that we're trying to get them to go. So this is my daughter, Lydia. I keep this picture and I look at it from time to time. She's dressed up in my clothes, pretending to be me. It's cute and it's funny, but it also shows me my great responsibility. Because one day, you know, she's, she's not just putting on my clothes, she's putting on oftentimes my attitude and my values. She's putting on my attitude toward my wife, her mother, my attitude toward money, my attitude toward work, all these things she's picking up on and my other children are too. And they're growing into my mold, whether I want them to or not. And so I look at this picture often at least a few times a week, and I pray and say, God, may I be an example worthy of my kids to imitate and to emulate, because better or for worse, they're going to. So I like this picture, and it illustrates that whether I want them to or not, they're, they're coming up behind me, and they're watching me and following me down the path I'm going. And this isn't just for parents and children. We also see this in the Bible when Paul um, would travel and plant churches, and he would disciple the people there. He told them, do what I do, be who I am. So in Philippians 4, 9, Paul writes to the church in Philippi, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. To the church in Corinth, Paul wrote, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So this is, this is how we disciple people whether it's our children or whether it's church members or whoever it is, that's how you disciple, is you be the model you want them to follow. Now with parents, we don't have to tell our kids, hey, be imitators of me, because they're going to do it, regardless of whether we want them to or not. We don't have to tell them, practice these things, because kids are going to practice them, whether we want them to or not, right? 
And I, I kind of get scared when I read the first part of Philippians 4 and 9 there. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Now I think of all the things my children have learned and received and heard and seen in me. I, I have good days. I have bad days, too. I imagine I'm not the only one. And I, I wonder, what things have they seen and heard and learned and received that I wish they hadn't? Well, the good news is we don't have to be perfect. The good news is we're all growing. No one has arrived yet. And so the best example is a growing example. So if our kids are going to imitate us, if our kids are going to take on our attitudes and values, whoops, I just hit the mic, I apologize, and actions, uh, let's just ask ourselves, in what ways do you want your kids to imitate you? Hopefully there's a whole list. I want my kids to love my spouse like I do. I want my kids to go to church like I do. I want my kids to work hard like I do. I want my kids to pray like I do. So there's hopefully a whole list of things that you want your kids to imitate. The opposite question, in what ways do you hope your kids don't imitate you? I imagine there's a list there as well. Um, if you're brave and you're married, you can ask your spouse, hey, in what ways do you hope the kids imitate me? In what ways do you hope they don't imitate me? That would be a wonderful conversation to have with your spouse if you're married. And perhaps you could um, come up with some things to work on for both of you. If you're single, you might could ask a pastor or a close friend, and I bet they could have some good advice for you as well. So the point of being an example is that we must be today the people we want our kids to be someday. Or we must be now the people we want our kids to be tomorrow. Because they're growing up, they're watching us, and when they leave, their memory of us is going to shape them uh, dramatically. Now, like I said before, that can be a really disheartening thing to think about. I think, I think if you're like me, I think of all the ways I fall short and all the ways I hope my kids do not imitate me. And like I said, the truth is none of us are perfect. None of us in this life will ever be fully worthy of imitation in every single way. We're always, in this life, we're always going to have faults. We're always going to have uh, rough edges, I guess is one way to say it, to our personalities. I guess that's a euphemism. We're all going to have sinful sides to our personalities. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? Um, but the, the, the goal is that we're growing into the people we want our kids to grow into one day. And we are working intentionally to become the people we want our kids to become. Okay, so what does this look like? We, we are examples as parents in everything. I could spend a month talking about every single way we're examples. You're an example in your attitude toward money, your attitude toward work, your attitude toward church, your uh, work ethic, how clean you keep your house, what kind of food, I mean, everything. We're an example in everything, but I want us to look at just two things today. How are we examples in our relationships with other people? And how are we examples in our relationship with God? So I focus on relationships because I think those are the most important aspects. If our kids learn to do well with God and do well with others, they will be well prepared for life. So certainly teach them to clean up their room. Certainly teach them how to cook meals and how to handle money and how to work hard and have a good attitude. Those are very good things. We're not going to cover those today because I, I'm not going to spend a month. But I do want to go over our relationships. So let's look at our relationships with other people first. And when I think of my relationships with other people, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, you probably remember this passage as being about love. And love is expressed in relationship. And so the way you show your love or lack thereof is in the context of relationships with other people, with God, with your children, with everybody. 
And so let me just read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is love, putting someone before yourself, counting someone as more important than yourself. That's love summed up right there. Now, usually when I've heard this passage taught or preached, you know, the, the preacher or teacher, whoever it is, and I haven't heard Pastor Bill teach this, so I'm not, I don't know what he does. I'm not picking on him. They'll say, you know, God is love. First John says God is love. So we can replace the word love with God. God is patient and kind. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. God does not insist on his own way, on his own way. And it doesn't quite work, right? I mean, God does insist on his way because he's God. <laughs> so he gets to. <laughs> he's different than us and he has different uh, privileges, I guess you could say, than us because he's God and made everything, sustains everything. But what I want us to do today is to put in our names in place of love. So let's, let's look at it from our perspective. So instead of love, I'm going to read John. John is patient and kind. John does not envy or boast. John is not arrogant or rude. John does not insist on his own way. John is not irritable or resentful. John does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. John bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So, you know, I think I think it, hit home, it hits home for me when I put my name in there and I see where am I doing well, where am I not doing well. And maybe it does for you too, but I think to really grasp this, again, we need to put it in the context of relationships. So for those of you who are married, how is your example with your spouse? It's said and it's true that our children learn marriage from watching their parents' marriage. And whether intentionally or not, when they grow up, at least in the beginning, they model their love in their marriage, their relationship in their marriage, based on what their parents had. And so toward my wife, am I patient and kind? Do I envy or boast? Am I arrogant or rude? And I think if you really try to narrow it down, again, you can ask your spouse, but our marriage, our marriage is one of the most important relationships we have. I guess I would say the second most important relationship we have after our relationship with God. And it models for our kids such an important relationship in their lives that we, we really need to take care how we treat our spouses, how we talk to our spouses about our spouses, how we interact with them, how we handle it when we disagree with them. It's okay to disagree with your spouse is how you handle it. Another context to look at how we are loving well would be our relationship with our friends. And a good way to test your relationship with your friends and even others is, how do you talk about people when they're not around? I think it's easier for all of us to treat people well when we're looking at them in the face and a little bit harder when they're not around. Do your kids hear you talk uh, badly about other people when they're not around? Do our kids hear, do my kids hear me complain about other people when they're not around? So we're always setting an example. And finally, how generous are we? And I don't mean money, I mean time and with convenience. So relationships take work and a good, a good friend will give you his or her time and will give you his or her effort and even inconvenience themselves to help you when it's in need. And I've experienced this many times with the church. When Daniel's in the hospital, people are bringing meals, people are calling and asking how they can help and they're actively helping. So I've experienced from you guys, church, this active love, this active generosity of time and effort. So we are examples in our relationships with other people. If you want to talk more about that, just contact me and we can talk about marriage, or friends, and things like that. 
I thought about including marriage in this week. I just didn't have the space to do it. So I'd love to talk to you more about that. I'm sure Pastor Zach, Pastor Bill, Pastor Randy would love to as well. So we're going to move to our relationship with God. And I'm going to spend more time on our relationship with God because it is the most important relationship we have, bar none. More important than marriage, more important than parents, parenting, more important than our kids is our relationship with God. And it's our relationship with God that forms a foundation for every other relationship in our lives. Isn't it true that when you're walking in the Spirit and you've been enjoying the Lord and enjoying His presence, you're naturally more loving toward other people? And I think the opposite is true as well, right? If you've been walking in the flesh, if you have not been setting your mind on the things of God, it's a lot easier to be cranky and selfish um, with other people. And so if we get our relationship with God right, and I guess that's a bad way to put it, but if we consistently draw near to God, consistently uh, set our minds on the things of God, it's going to spill over in a good way to our relationship with other people. So we're going to look at Psalm 1. You guys can open that up. We're going to be in Psalm 1. And this is like, for me personally, this is like the example of the godly man. There are others and some people like others, but for me, this is it. So we're going to read Psalm 1. I'm going to read the first two verses. And in this psalm, we see two types of people, the blessed man and the wicked. We see the actions of both and the results which both will experience. So I'm going to read Psalm 1, verses 1 through 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now let's stop there. I just saw my slide. We'll, do, we'll just do verse 1 here. So we see the blessed man, and we see what he does not do first, right? What does the blessed man not do? He does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of scoffers. So if we look at the verbs used there, walk, stand, sit, these describe everyday actions. So what we're seeing is his, this man's everyday routine is to not go near the wicked, not to listen to them, not to join in with them, but rather to avoid them. Now, when I read these verses, this is a quick aside. Today, I think of our use of technology. How often do we sit in the company of sinners on Netflix? Do we join with scoffers on Facebook? I, I, think, I think the church, by and large, does a good job of physically separating from the wicked sinners and scoffers, but I'm afraid in our use of media, be it TV or social media or YouTube or whatever, I'm afraid we're spending a lot of time with wicked people. I don't want to go too far in that and say, if you have Netflix, you're sinning. I don't think that. I have Netflix. But I think we need to be very careful that we're not communing with wicked people every night. All right, I'll stop. Back to the story. I'm, I, I get to preach in a little bit. I apologize. All right, so we saw what the blessed man does not do. Let's look at what he does do. Is that correct grammar? I don't know. Verse 2, but his delight, the blessed man's delight, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So he delights in the law of the Lord. The word law there is the word Torah, so it can be translated as instruction or even, that's what they call the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy. So the blessed man's delight is in God's word. And on his word, we could say, on God's word, he meditates day and night. Uh, let's, look, let's look at the word meditate. You know, when we think of meditation today, we think of the Eastern version, right? Where we empty our minds and somehow we achieve a better state by denying ourselves desires, by denying ourselves uh, sensory perceptions. Well, that's, that's not what the Bible means when it says meditation. That has nothing to do with the biblical view of meditation. When the Bible uses the word meditate, it's not talking about emptying our minds. It's talking about filling our minds with God's word, with the truth, the truths of God's word. So when the blessed man is meditating on God's word, that means he's filling his mind 
with God's word. He's thinking about God's word, pondering God's word, turning it over in his mind. I don't think it means he sits and reads the Bible like 24 hours a day. I think it means he reads it some, he puts it down, but he's still thinking about the word of the Lord. He's meditating on it. He's going over it in his mind, filling his mind with it, asking what is there to learn from this passage or this verse, whatever the case may be. And what I want you to notice here, notice what comes first. His delight in the law of the Lord comes before he meditates on that law day and night. His delight spills over into his actions. His joy powers his work. Now I say work is meditation. So his joy is what leads him to action. His delight is what leads him to meditate on God's word. So this is not someone saying, I should read the Bible, I guess I'll do it. This is not someone, well, I guess I need to be a good example, so I'm going to crack this Bible. No, he he's enjoys it. He looks forward to it. His delight is in it. Have you ever had something that you looked forward to that you were, that you were joyful about? It's okay to do that. It might be a vacation you had. You look forward to it. It might be a certain time with a family reunion. It might be when you were baptized or perhaps when one of your kids was baptized. And when, when you were looking forward to that, it wasn't a chore to get ready for it, right? It was, it's not a chore to plan a vacation you're excited about. You're excited. You want to do it. And it's not a chore when you were driving to go be baptized or driving your kid to go be baptized. You weren't thinking, man, I don't really want, I want to go to church today. No, you were thinking, I can't wait to get there. It's going to be awesome to get baptized or to see my kid get baptized. That joy spilled over into you working and it wasn't you kicking yourself and pushing yourself. It came naturally. So that, that's the goal is to have such joy and delight in the Lord, that it spills over in our lives to where we're meditating, we're praying and praising, and it's just a natural outflow of what's going on in our hearts and in our minds. So his delight spills over into his whole life, and it drives his meditation. We're going to get back to that, but I want to look real quick at the whole psalm, so I'm not taking it out of context. We've seen the actions of both the blessed man and the wicked. The wicked are taking counsel, they're scoffing, probably making foolish plots like the kings in Psalm 2. And we see the results of their actions. In verse 3, because the blessed man rejoiced in God's word and meditated on it, I'll read verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. The blessed man, he's like a fruitful and stable tree. He, excuse me, he yields the fruit of godliness and he has a lasting influence. He bears fruit. He has strong roots, which keep him secure in times of difficulty and storms. He is a constant source of blessing to others. I just see the stability and the fruitfulness of his life. I hope you guys see that too. Now contrasted with that is verse 4. The wicked who have been scheming and plotting and sinning, verse 4 says, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Chaff is just that loose stuff, sticks, and maybe some loose like grass and stuff, and it just blows here and there. It has no roots. There's no stability. It bears no fruit. There's nothing good to do with chaff except to burn it, right? Isn't that what the New Testament says as well? So the wicked who are sinning and scheming and plotting, they have no roots, which means they're blown this way and that way with whatever new doctrine comes in, whatever new fad comes in, and they bear no fruit. They are no good to anyone. Now, verse 5 and 6 is really neat. And this shows the ultimate result of the actions of both. So we kind of see what kind of life they're leading in verses 3 and 4. In verses 5 and 6, we see what the end is. 
and the end for the wicked is not very good. Verse 5, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The wicked don't get to, don't get to stand in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked don't get to spend eternity with God. The way of the wicked will perish. They will suffer eternal torment away from the presence of the Lord and his might. 2 Thessalonians 1. In verse 5, do you notice the wicked, they want to, they want to stand in the congregation of the righteous? Do you remember in verse 1 when the blessed man did not stand in the way of sinners, did not sit in the seat of scoffers, did not walk in the counsel of the wicked? Well, now their positions are reversed. The wicked want to join the righteous, but they cannot because they spent their life sinning and not obeying God. The blessed man who avoided the wicked now gets the ultimate audience, the ultimate congregation, which is the congregation of the Lord in heaven. So I think it's really neat how right now, perhaps, the wicked are content. They shouldn't be, but maybe they are. And they are enjoying what looks like stable, fruitful lives, even if it's not. But the end will come. And that end will come for the wicked when they want to stand in the company of the righteous, but will not be able. Okay. So the next question is obviously, how, how can we be like the blessed man? You know, we, we all want a life of stability and fruitfulness. And we all want to be in glory later, right? None of us wants to be chaff. And we want the same thing for our children. So how can we be like this man? You know, the question is, do I delight in God's word? Does my joy in God spill over into every area of my life? Well, the answer is not, not all the time, right? There's probably sometimes that's true of me and true of you. It's probably not all the time. So what do we do? when it's not bubbling up within us? And the answer is spiritual disciplines. It may sound strange for me to say that spiritual disciplines are what's going to lead us to freedom and joy, but it's true. And, 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 and we think this way in other areas. We think we know that discipline leads to joy and freedom in other areas of life. Okay? So let's say you want to, to lose weight and be fit. Well, to do that, you know, you're going to have to discipline yourself to eat right and exercise every day. And when you know that when you correctly and consistently apply these disciplines of eating right and exercising, eventually you're going to get the freedom, the joy of being fit, right? Or let's say you want to save money, so you discipline yourself to not spend money here and there frivolously. You make a budget and you stick to it. And when you correctly and consistently discipline yourself to stick to your budget, eventually you'll have the freedom and joy of having saved money. So we see that discipline is the path to freedom and joy in every area of life, as well as the area of godliness. Now, let's say I wanted to lose weight and get fit. If I only ate right and only exercised when I felt like it, I'm not going to get very far. If every other day I say, no, I'm tired, I'm just going to eat a bag of chips and sit on the couch. Well, I'm not going to lose very much weight and I'm not going to get very fit. If I only stick to this discipline that I want to get what I want two days out of the week, well, I'm not going to get it. It's a constant, a consistent commitment to a discipline that leads to my freedom and joy. And spiritual disciplines work the same way. If we want that goal, we have to discipline ourselves even when we don't want to, those moments when we don't want to, so that we eventually meet our goal. So if we want deep joy in God, we have to discipline ourselves to meditate on his word, to pray, to enjoy his presence, to remind ourselves of his benefits, like Psalm 103 says, forget not all his benefits. There's going to be days when you don't feel like reading the Bible, or you don't feel like praying or loving others, but those are the most important days to stick to a discipline. And so I want us to understand the, it sounds contradictory, but I think it's true that discipline leads to joy, discipline leads to freedom. 
So the way we can be examples for our children is to discipline ourselves toward goals of godliness. So do you want your children to read the Bible every day? Well, be their example. And show them how to read the Bible even when they don't feel like it. Do you want your kids to pray every day? Well, be their example and show them how to do it even when you don't really feel like it. And that's a perfect, a great example for our kids to see us struggle and overcome that struggle is more helpful than an example of perfection because that's, not, that's just not attainable. All right, so I'm just going to talk about two disciplines real quick and then I'll let you go. I keep going longer than I mean to. I apologize for that. Let's talk about getting the Bible into our minds and into our hearts. Uh, reading the Bible every day, uh, that's foundational, right? We, we all know that. We've all heard that. And I hope that each, each of you, I hope that all of us, are taking time every day to look at God's Word. I would recommend that you use a Bible reading plan that takes you through the whole Bible. You can find those on the internet, and I can put up a link in the comments here after I'm done with the video. I know for myself, there are certain parts of the Bible I turn to all the time, and there are other parts of the Bible I don't turn to unless something tells me to, unless Pastor Bill is preaching from there, or unless I'm looking up a certain verse. And so I really enjoy my Bible reading plan because it takes me places in the Bible I would not go without it. So I would recommend getting a daily reading plan. If you want to read the Bible once a year, great. If you want to read the Bible once every two years, great. That's fine. The speed is not the, the point. The journey is the point. So what the lesson from Psalm 1, though, is that our spiritual disciplines don't end when we close our Bible, don't end when we say amen in our morning prayer time. No, the goal of our spiritual disciplines is to get God's word in our heads so that we can meditate on it the rest of the day. So as you're reading, find a certain verse and think about that verse the rest of your day. Or if you're reading a story in the Bible, like a narrative, a story of Abraham or something, think about that story the rest of the day. So the goal is for our daily Bible reading to spill over and to meditating on it the rest of the day. That's where we find we, we commune with God. It's not a checklist. We don't say, I read my Bible, closed, done. I'm not gonna think about God till the next morning or the next night, whenever you do this. Um, hopefully it carries over. Another way to regularly meditate on scripture is carry your Bible with you. Open it up several times a day. Set your phone for an alarm if you have that kind of freedom and you can have an alarm set. Um, easier than carrying a physical Bible is just carrying a Bible app. That's why I put up this slide. The YouVersion app is a wonderful free Bible app. I use it all the time. And what I try to do is I try to take it out and read um, at least a paragraph or a psalm or something short at least a couple times a day so that I'm, I'm stopping and I'm putting my mind, I'm putting God's Word into my mind or I'm focusing my mind onto God's Word. So it's a daily rhythm and not just a one-time checklist, not just a one-time I did that, moving on. Uh, memorizing scripture has been the best way for me personally to meditate on it. I enjoy, and I, I need to get better at doing this regularly, I kinda, I'm kind of off and on, but I enjoy um, memorizing one verse after another. Now, whether I memorize a whole book or a whole chapter or half a chapter, I don't really care. But when I memorize verses one after the other, I'm meditating on an entire passage of Scripture after I get a few memorized. And you can call it up when you're doing the dishes. You can call it up when you're driving, when you're cooking, whatever it is you do, laundry. And you can meditate on Scripture while you're doing anything, really. Another way, if you don't want to memorize, you can have it play on audio. The YouVersion app has audio, so you can have Scripture playing while you do those things. It would be a good way to put your mind on it. Um, so those are just some tips I have, so hopefully some helpful hints there to get the Bible into us and our minds focused on the Bible at various points during the day. I'll talk real quick about prayer the same way, you know, hopefully you have a time of prayer each day where that's the one thing you're doing, like you're focused, that's your prayer time in the morning is best. If you do it at nighttime, okay, that's fine too, whatever works for you, I suppose. But hopefully that focused time of prayer leads us to be praying throughout the day. And so one thing that I like to do, in the same way as Bible reading, it, it spills over into our day. Hopefully our prayer life spills over into our day as well. I put uh, things to pray for on my phone, on my calendar. I have different things. And so I'll stop. Maybe if, it's probably only a couple times a day. I could get better. 
And I just stop and I pray for those things. I pray for you guys that way. I have it on my calendar. So I'm making sure I'm praying for everybody. I know that uh, Pastor Bill does that too. He's a, yep. So that's where I got it from. Thank you, Pastor Bill. So hopefully we can pray without ceasing, like the Bible tells us to, by reminding ourselves at different times uh, that we need to be praying. Prayer Mate is an app for your phone. Um, it is, it's a really good app. You can make lists to pray for. They have some lists for you if you want to do that. And you can set it to remind you to pray at different times. So that's a big help. But the main point I want you to get away uh, to get from this is spiritual disciplines lead us to freedom and joy. And our spiritual disciplines should spill over into our everyday life, our moment to moment, hour to hour life. So if you want to learn more about spiritual disciplines, there's a lot more than what I covered today. I'm out of time. But Donald Whitney is a professor at Southern Seminary, and he wrote a great book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. So I heartily recommend that book if you want to learn more about disciplines. And I would love to read this book with you. So if you're a parent or a church member or shoot a regular attender, and you want to read this with someone, you want to talk about it with someone, I would love to do that. So get in touch with me. We'll read the book together. We'll get on Zoom once a week, once every couple weeks, talk about what we're learning, and uh, go from there. Okay, guys, so what did we learn? We learned that for better or for worse, we are always examples to our kids. And secondly, we learned in our relationship with God, and really, y'all just stick relationship with God, spiritual disciplines lead to spiritual joys. And so to become the man of Psalm 1, where we're delighting and taking joy in God, it takes work to get there. And that's fine, because it takes work to reach every goal that we would set. So let's talk about a couple questions for you to think about. So when we think about being examples to our kids, what is one thing? Just one thing you can start, stop, or change to be a better example to your children. It may be you want to read your Bible every day if you're not. It may be you want to be more respectful to your spouse if that's an issue. Or it may be you want to be more slow to anger, whatever it is. What's one thing that you can start, stop, or change to be, to, to be a better example to your children? Another thing I'd recommend, if you want to, it's more work, it's up to you if you do it or not, which I suppose is true of all of this, is make a list and write out who you want your kids to be as adults and what you want your kids to be able to do as adults. This is a very helpful practice. Think of character qualities. Do you want them to be kind? Do you want them to be slow to anger? Do you want them to know how to manage money? Do you want them to know how to change the oil in the car? And make, make a list of that. And then ask yourself, like, how can I work toward getting my kids to this list? And that really helps you to be intentional about raising your kids. So you're an active parent and not a passive parent. Um, so that includes skills. And it's also a great list to pray through. How often do you pray for your kids to be slow to anger or kind or respectful to their future spouse? Those are great things to be praying now. So those are two recommendations I have. For the, the other thing we learned, spiritual disciplines lead to spiritual joys. What are some ways you can grow in your disciplines? What are some ways you can maybe be more consistent in some disciplines you occasionally do, or perhaps add some disciplines you're not currently doing? If you're not memorizing scripture, maybe you could do that. If you don't fast regularly, maybe you could add that. So there are a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different ways to grow in godliness. All right, guys, that is all I have. I apologize for going over. I thought this was going to be short. I was wrong. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or feedback you want to give, just let me know. And I'd love to help you with this however I can. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for watching whoever uh, will watch later. So let me end my live video. Thank you, guys.